Okay, I think we can start with inviting you to come a bit closer if you feel like it, and we just decided that we will have a, a beginning of a conversation that is maybe a bit more informed about what happened, but then really, like, hopefully, I just have a collaborative like, situation where we can just, like, everyone just wants to talk. Um, okay, so now that I took the word, I'm going to continue for a bit. Uh, I am Christoph Brunner, I'm really responsible for this uh, dialogue, on, which has the heading of performance. And I think uh, because of the keynote and the last two panels, uh, you, have, you have been introduced in various ways uh, to everyone except this uh, is Stalpas. <laughs> who is a, a professor in performance philosophy at Ghent University, so she's the most local. Uh, and um, she's been working a lot on the this and performance and performing arts for the last years. And uh, she's here for the lab as well. Uh, Anna and Susanna have given their uh, uh, presentation just on performance, uh, which I couldn't attend because I was at Juliette Boulos. Uh, <laughs> and we could all attend there and see, you know, so the, they couldn't attend it because they were because performing they were in the first way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can help each other out here on uh, feeding each other in on the process. Um, uh, so I uh, was a bit, uh, yeah, I don't know, I personally just struggled with uh, the, the, the heading, as I said, of performance. And uh, I was just uh, curious to start by the way with maybe um, thinking like uh, what performance might mean or might not mean because it's not a concept that Deleuze necessarily talks about. Uh, he has uh, other other concepts that uh, pertain to what we might think of when we talk about performance: uh, questions of time, temporalization, and uh, also uh, a question that we somehow all share very much. I think that of grammar. Uh, I know from your work that you have been working on that uh, in various ways. And uh, yes, so maybe we can start with <coughs> thinking actually the status of the performance uh, in that point of entry that deals more with questions of time and timing in your perspective. Uh, that is one remark. I would like to start with the other remark. Since we, we have uh, uh, people coming from different backgrounds that are maybe more artistic, maybe more, more philosophical, without uh, really having to separate them out entirely, I think we're all, we're all working on undoing these kind of binaries very much in the practice. Nevertheless, I think one way of discussing this is less uh, from a disciplinary background, or only from a disciplinary background, but rather from a a uh, question of different techniques and what kind of techniques do we use to deal with that. And I think these techniques, techniques have something intrinsically performative, you might call it that way. So, yeah. Um, so, I'm up. <laughs> maybe someone wants to go with this, or should I address you? Of performance, or he doesn't use the term of performance, but he does use the 
the notion of theater as he uses the notion of cinema. And I think it's in the introduction of difference and repetition that he already says that um, in the search for new uh, ways of philosophical expressions, um, in the way Nietzsche had it in mind, in a kind of provoking protest movement, one also has to look in how these new ways of philosophical expression might be a gender, I'm paraphrasing how this is not a quotation, it can be um, these new means of philosophical expression can be continued, and he says today, which is 1968, I think it still comes for today, in forms of theater and cinema. And of course we know the cinema books, the time image, image and the movement image, but I think he also talks a lot about theater and how theater can provoke thoughts. Um, and in terms of theater, in difference and repetition, he traces the notion of representation and representation back to Aristotle and uh, Descartes. Uh, so for Aristotle, of course, you have the classical dramatic aesthetics where time and place or coordinates in the development of a plot and where movement turns into motivated action and where the spectator is expected to grab things to understand. In that we have the word begrijpen, which means to understand, it's also to grab things. Um, and I think he was thinking of other ways of theatre, where this notion of unity of action, where this notion of motivated action, which is embedded in a plot, is opened up, and where catharsis is like engendering shocks to thought. And then you can, I think, think of ways of making theatre which are very, very diverse. You can call it theatre or performance. But yeah, performances that he found keep things open, that provoke thought, and be it the aesthetic of intensities at work, or the performer who unfolds himself, himself as a kind of philosopher. So I think this might be still relevant today, thinking about performing arts, thinking about theatre, thinking about performance, performers, music, dance. It's just to open things up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would directly connect my thoughts with what you were saying. I think he is alluding in difference and repetition to Kierkegaard primarily and to Nietzsche. So he says they started to invent a new philosophy as a new way of theatre in itself. Why as a new way of theatre? Because you have the thought of the multiplicity there in theatre. So it's not that you have one character and it's not dialectical. So if you have Socrates, you have also in Plato several characters who are suddenly showing up. There yeah, are Socrates and Archimedes and all these people. But at the very end, he is a typical classical philosopher because at the end, all characters are, in a way, culminated in the one character of Socrates. So he's like Hegel or Socrates, they are thinking dialectical. You have always one hero at the end who is aufheben, as Hegel dialectical aufheben, so who is synthesizing all the characters. And at the end you have a kind of head or king who is the representative of all the characters, the characters who are showing up in a platonic theatre, which is a typical classical uh, philosophical theatre. And I think exactly what you are saying is important, because he says, if you look at people like Nietzsche or Kierkegaard, it's not animal. He speaks about animals. Yeah. In Zarathustra, you have animals, a lot of animals. You have Zarathustra and so on. And it's not so that you have one character that synthesizes all. So I think what he likes, about theater, without always calling it theater, is that it is really a sphere where you have a multiplicity of characters which are not synthesized in a head. So I think that is 
a beautiful character of theatre he, he would like to, to embrace. Uh, just in addition to open up maybe the topic a little bit, my background is uh, from an arts, I'm a trained actress, and um, therefore I want to point out that what I am also a teacher at the University of Music and Performing Arts, I've got a PhD in philosophy, just as our uh, Leidenschaft, because of desire. So, but I'm an act actress, and what I'm interested most is in the performative act in itself. Uh, when uh, you perform and in a highly creative atmosphere, what pops up in that moment? And I think in that, uh, just to open up the, the, the topic, you wrote about time. What means time in popping up at the high creative atmosphere? This maybe is a thing what's of great interest in my work. And I think, just to run a little bit forward, therefore, there doesn't exist any technique. Because at that moment you are active and passive at the same moment. And for the passive player, what kind of technique could there be? None. It has to be given. It has, yeah, okay, just to try to solve. So with that, thinking really hard and fast, <laughs> theater is not an area, um, something has come to mind. Um, I responded a little harshly to someone this morning about the importing of philosophy onto process. And I feel very strongly that, that what artists bring to the table is are a, a wealth of techniques, precisely, right? Sure. A wealth of processes. Sure. And it's precisely because of that wealth of process that they're capable of inventing those techniques on the spot. Yes, right? Sure. And so, it seems to me that one of the gifts that Deleuze and Guattari's thinking gives us is that call to, to, um, de, to invent conditions un, through which new ways of encountering, um, new ways of, of activating the event can be ascertained. But what I would add to that is that, at least in the way that I'm looking at things, this doesn't have to happen at the level of the human. So perhaps for the conversation, I would bring in the idea that, that um, in every process, there's a schism, a cut that reorients it. And this cut is not reoriented by a subject outside that process. The cut is, it, it involves in the subject that is forming in the event, of course, if that's a subject, but, but in that relationship something happens that alters the whole field of experience. And maybe one of the things we can do today is think about the performativity of that schism, mm -hmm. so that um, we can explore those questions of the dramatization, of, of the, the reorientation and the ways in which this cut is not already in an, in an environment of, of, of the moral. So one of the things I've been interested in a lot is to, um, to become, um, to create techniques that might make us attuned or, or sensitive to how these cuts or schisms evolve even when the cut is discordant. And perhaps it's always to some degree discordant. And so the techniques also have to some degree to be techniques of an, that they can compose with a certain kind of anything. Yeah. I think that's that's wonderful what you're saying there. And, and maybe I can I can look into my memory of watching performances where I really felt mm -hmm. encountering the other on stage as a spectator being moved by a technique that opens up and goes beyond uh, hiding yourself behind a character and having this performativity of saying like, look, I am negotiating with this character, I'm also a body dealing with a chair and a table on stage, opening that up and opening up the, the, the classical dramatic aesthetics, which is very much a teleological principle of cause and effect of action and reaction. I was looking to performance by each company still here, and I was very, very much struck by, so it's, it's, it's 
on King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear, it uses the dramatic text of King Lear, but what happens on stage is much more than that. And at a certain moment you have Cordelia, she dies. Now one of the, the, the scenes that is very difficult to perform on stage is dying, because you know actually as a spectator that you cannot die on stage, otherwise you won't have no performance. But on stage normally you have this illusion, so there is this, this, this suspension of disbelief, etc. But what, uh, what happens there is you have this plot of King Lear, and Cordelia, she, the, she, her death scene is not within this logical chain of cause and effect of action and reaction. In fact, none of the actors die because of something else happening or an action. So it's not like I am falling now because you hit me with a dragon, which is action which is motivated action and action and fiction, logical. What she does is she has this story and these words are for the dialogues. And what she does is she glides around the table, very slowly. She gets up again, she does it again. And she does it endlessly, not infinitely, but like in a combination of yeah, infinite and... It's, 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 it becomes a kind of movement, what movement. So she disconnects from the story and what happens is you see this body having this contact with the table, resonating speed, movement, the notions of the laser, and you have to open up the performance of do I have to use this? No? Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. What happens for the spectator, the performance was described by a by a someone who wrote about layers below in smoke. He said, like, you feel frustrated as a spectator because you want to follow the story of King Lear. But there it disconnects, and then, or you disconnect yourself, and say, like, look, I don't have a connection with this, or you open up. You allow yourself not to be the thinking subject that has these hooks of, I'm, I think so, I am, therefore I know, I insist, I know who I am. So there is a kind of opening up towards another kind of relationality. Another kind of encountering this moving body, which you cannot grab always from superficial characteristics as race, gender, age, which happen then to represent a character in the story. You have to open up towards this, these intensities. And it's a kind of mental flexibility you're being invited to. And this is when I like performers, when they have this technique of opening up, I don't know. Sure, I didn't want to uh, put on a misunderstanding, but there is a sensitive moment, yeah. and the discussion in the area I'm working in is the sensitive moment is, uh, the sure, you have to have a lot of abilities, a lot of tools, no doubt about that. And, but the moment when the, 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 the moment where this in-between opens up and this I'm sure, you cannot reach with techniques. This is what I wanted to, uh, to, to point out. Mm -hmm. and it, sorry, just to add, if one shows that he is a very superficial technician, then it's lost. Yeah. And does it connect with the improvisation then? The, the, the courage to improvise? Or? No, no, you have, as, a, as an actor, you have to be able to repeat. But in the repetition, there is, has always to be the moment that this difference to, to be inscribed. And if you, this, to open up this difference, maybe you are thinking mm -hmm. the other way around, you cannot reach with a technique. This is, uh, you can try, but you have also to give up to try. This is a paradox. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. Maybe one way to segue this is this discussion that has still addressed performance as a stage act right? in the framework of the performing arts. Uh, but I know uh, since I checked your work and so on, and uh, I worked with Aaron for a long time and uh, Julien also for a bit, you know that you're all in set up settings that are collaborative between different kinds of uh, people from different kinds of backgrounds that uh, um, are in, in Julien, for instance. And, Curious about how you, you can see this in a setting that is more concerned with collaboration, with uh, experiment, with workshop, where, it isn't, where there is no necessary uh, public uh, or performance spectator binary. Um, and I mean, this happens in all kinds of experimental forms of theory, 
creative in there, it also happens. Uh, in, in more research creation, artistic research uh, environments, and, and I think that's uh, maybe another way of approaching the question of technique, that is not just the technique of the performer in terms of crafts and skill, but something that imminently occurs in the moment of uh, collaborating, for instance. So, uh, techniques for relation, techniques for collaboration, techniques for uh, inventing other modes of, of, uh, of engaging with the movement of thought that then becomes the movement of the body, becomes the movement through space and time, etc. etc. And so, um, maybe I could uh, use what you were saying about uh, the classical theater and, uh, and I don't know the term you use, maybe you didn't use the term, but let's say a the, uh, the theater that embraces the multiplicity of the characters that are not gathered to to meet into one head or one king, as you said. So that's one way to see uh, representation in theater. But of course, you could apply the same thing to the process by which you create. And so I think what you're referring to, to Christophe, is uh, an attempt that you set up a creative process where there is not that one author that uh, gathers all the voices, but rather uh, that there is maybe an author that uh, creates a situation that enable, enables a uh, multiplicity of, uh, of voices to, to co-create. And uh, I'm approaching that with, with, with the term which is very used in the performance uh, field of scores, or I like, I think it's uh, read in one of your texts. It's written by like enabling constraints. Uh, I find it a really a nice way to, to phrase it. So, constraints that are um, yeah, allowing creation by um, setting up a certain situation where, well, yeah, I think suppose it's about defining constraints that you communicate to a group of people so they share the same parameters and uh, get involved into it in a way that allows the um, emergent properties. So we agree on that contract, on this set of parameters. And we, we play all this, that same games, only it allows for communication between the, the different performers or artists. But I think also importantly, and it, it, it joins what you were saying, uh, earlier, uh, we can also try to suspend our sense of subjectivity so that every subject is part of, of a bigger, bigger collective that includes the score itself, like the verbal, <coughs> the verbal statements within the space, maybe the shift of light, uh, objects, the materiality of, of then maybe to draw and these things about um, co participate I mean they are participating in the, the co-emergence of, of an artwork or of a process. I can use it on. For me, I like very much what Deleuze says in one of his very late books, What is Philosophy, where he says, philosophy and the art is the experience of the too much. And I think this has something to do with what you were saying, that you know, as far as I as a subject can control the process, and I can say, okay, let's meet there in this restaurant, yeah? If there is no accident, we can control it. You know, we simply go there and probably in the correct time. But for me, it is very important. This is also how we work artistically and philosophically. And this is why I like the format of, uh, for example, creating big events. Big only really in the fantasy thing because. I have to lose control in that event because you know there is no chance anymore that there are so many people involved, so many things are going on 
that the processes will be stimulated even if I try my best to control it, and I try my best to control it. But in the very, as you said, it's in the very moment of a paradox situation, so that in Germany you'd say it's entgleitet me. So I am I'm really, it, my control fades away, translate in a certain It fades away because there are so many processes going on in many things, and that is a, a very, for me, reason dangerous. It's not that I say because sometimes they do not work. You have to raise that, but then there is a climate of exhaustion also because there is too much. There is simply too much, yeah? and it's not anymore that I can, uh, as a subject, control all these things. And that is the point where often interesting moments can suddenly pop for me. Uh, and it's also a thing which I like because first, when you lose control, there is fear for sure. So it's really a way of also personally to jump over this fear and say, okay, now you have to give it free and, and, and say amor fati to what will happen in advance already, before it happens. Yeah? And that's also a Levinasian structure, so, which I think is very, really, if you come back to birth, as Levinas would say, it's really when you affirm somebody who is not yet here, you really affirm him before he is even here, so you don't know who is coming. Yeah? And it's a little bit the same for me with these things. So I have to say Amor Fati before they take place, even if they fail. So you, you know that every word is already a reverse. Sure, very easy. Yeah, and I'm so curious. You are the first finding out why you're here. Uh, as we sort of throw out these little nuggets to see them. Is this, is this what you, you want to talk about today? Um, I wanted to uh, come back also. Uh, I wanted to tell a story. It's not a story that's unfamiliar to at least one person in the room. But it, I think it touches a lot on these questions. And, and maybe if we have a conversation, it, it's something uh, worth coming back to. Um, because these questions that Christoph is asking and that other people are talking about, they, they feel very close to, to my heart. And um, so, you know, I spoke this morning about, about activism in large part because it's been a really rough year for anybody who's an activist. Um, we, I think so many of us across the world have been pushed to a limit and have been pushed to a limit asking where our practices are in relation to the practices of the political as it's unfolding. In the North American context, Black Lives Matter has been really hard. It's been extremely hard to be a white person in that context. It's been, um, it's been debilitating to see the deaths unfold. Unfold, I mean unfold. It's death all the time, it seems. So, and, and, uh, and then to see the refugees uh, that are called migrants, I don't know how refugees got to be called migrants, in, um, in Europe and and to feel the indigenous um, issues coming up to the fore in, in the Canadian context, in the Australian context. So, I mean, every year is a hard year, but this, this particular year felt, it felt really hard. And, and part of what I was trying to think through this morning was the, the question of how you continue. Because I think this is a question that, um, well, I know that many artists ask themselves this question. I mean, almost no artist that I've ever met is a precarious, for one. Now the academics are precarious too, and and the activists are precarious too. So I think I think um, that, that the question of how the, the the dramatization occurs or where the performative is is, is really key. And and I liked what what Judy was talking about in terms of the maybe constraints, and I wanted to to push it even in, in, in a bit to a, a an example where it it uh, that, that brings it closer perhaps to our own practice which is one of pretty incessant failure. So the sensa has a, 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 a practice of trying to do, um, trying to create a kind of emergent collectivity in the event, which means that in most cases we aren't adequate to the, to the necessities of the event. It's rare that, as the nurse would say, we are equal to the event. And, 
and we do it in a context of, of trying to really touch the, the impersonal and think about the impersonalities moving through the event while also trying to become attuned to where the uh, tendencies in the event are and how you could compose with them. So I just want to give you one example that, that could be interesting to think about as, a, as, an, as an emergent uh, constraint, let's say, that, um, that I've been thinking about. So this was an event that we held in Australia, and uh, Gekko and Kisak came too late, so they were only there in the aftermath, but Myra was there in this event. And we, we had gone to a place called Avoca, which was a couple hours outside of Melbourne, to an amazing artist's work. And this artist, you might know her work is Lyndall Jones. And if you don't know Lyndall Jones's work, then you should know it, I think. And Lyndall Jones did a, a, a beautiful, she's still doing it, a beautiful project called the Avoca Project, where she bought a house that was in disrepair. And this house was actually a European immigrant. So the house had been shipped to Australia in pieces and rebuilt on the ground. Australia in the 1850s. And when she bought the house about 12 years ago, um, she made an, it was it was in a location where the village around it was also dying. So the house was dying, the village was dying. And she made a, a, a call to the village and to artists at large to come to the house to um, to bring to it sustainability. And she left that open what that could mean. And over the years, people brought sustainability in very concrete ways, material sustainability through um, changing the water system in the house, bringing in um, solar, uh, looking at the desert or the desert-like conditions of the area and, and composing with them, eventually building an extraordinary garden which uh, worked with the movements of the water on the ground. But uh, what she invited us to do, or what she and I decided in collaboration, was to see whether there was another way to bring sustainability. And that was through uh, the kinds of event-based practices that the Sensab composes in. And it's perhaps important to say here that the Sensab is not a fixed group. It's open. So anybody is the Sensab. And so we often are working with people we've just met. In any case, we went to Avoca, and it was a total disaster. And here we were in, a, in, a, in an environment with, with artists who really had very similar ways of seeing things, very similar ways of thinking. And we had prepared so well. We had read all this stuff on Australia and art and sustainability. And, but we had forgotten a few things. One of the things we'd forgotten was jet lag. And so we arrived in Australia. I didn't know the body can. We forgot about what the body can't do. And so, but the, another thing that happened is that because the sense lab is nobody and everybody, it's quite. I think of it as a herd of cats, and of course there is no such thing as a herd of cats. It's it's really a bit, it's it's a, it's a, it's it's dissonant. It has a lot of ways of moving and a lot of ways of. Uh, inventing. And so it feels quite chaotic. And so the first thing Lyndall did was she put rules down. And, and in the placing of the rules, there was immediately this uneasiness in the encounter. There must be a way of entering, and we don't know it. And then as soon as the rules were out, Lyndall spent the whole time trying to take them back. But they were in the world. And so the score had been reinvented on the spot, but nobody understood the score because it wasn't laid out. The rules weren't totally clear. So it's, when you thought you knew a rule, like for example, that this is where the cutlery went, suddenly you found out that you used the wrong cutlery, that this was the grandmother's cutlery. You weren't supposed to use it. Or when you thought that you could do anything in the house to make it sustainable, suddenly you found out that it wasn't this part of the house, but it was this part of the house. So if you thought you could make it, and it, really, this was not done in any way to... It was, it was done in the way that often events occur in dissensus and in dissonance with a lot of goodwill. So anyway, I won't bore you with the details of four days and a lot of tension, 
But what I will tell you is on the very last morning of the event, after, um, after realizing that we, so many of us, like there were 30 or so people there, at least, I think at least 20 of us happened to have Brian Masumi's new book, What Animals Can Teach Us About Politics, in their bags. So we decided to do a reading group and read three paragraphs of this. And the part that we read was about the tiger-esque. And in the book, if you haven't read it yet, Brian talks about how the child, when the child is playing the tiger, the child doesn't mimic a tiger. The child becomes. And, um, and this tiger-esqueness of the child is what moves into the play. Anyway, the last day of the event, one person takes orange paint and spray paints the grass. To avoid predetermination, the field needs, requires at least three elements. This happened in the midst of a lot of cleanup and so on. We left Boca, and about an hour outside of it, I looked at Brian and said, Oh, fuck. What was that spray paint? And within an hour, I had a text message about the destruction of the environment. And so, in the moment of these kind of scores rewriting themselves, now we had a new one on the grass, which had caused this incredible tension, and uh, we can talk about it more if you want, but what happened, and this is really what I was wanting to say, is that a fabulation began to evolve. I sent out an investigation by email to people, including how the world had turned orange, and over a period of three weeks, 90-page fabulation moved across Gmail. And that was, for me, a really interesting example of a performance in the event that was truly out of the hands of any one participant, was uncomfortable to the extreme, but produced something that is still ripe for thought and activity. So I, I want to throw that out as maybe an example of something where it's not that you have to deny the subjectivity of all of the different things that happen, there were plenty of personal moments, but where I think the, the, the schism really alter the conditions of what could happen and even of what an event could be. I'd like to bring another term which is fermentation. Mm -hmm. So to bring this back to the question of time. Um, because for me a lot of what we're discussing are dealing with fermentation when we when we agree on suspending our control on, on, on the events and when we want um, and the simplicity to exist as such. I think fermentation plays a big role because you, you plant seeds or you, you put things out. And sometimes, yeah, it's what we're also describing the experience of spectators in front of this codec that I am again and again. Like sometimes you see that thing and you don't understand what, what is she doing or, or this person paint the spray and the moment, yeah, why not? But then these things evolve um, under the ground or through uh, pathways we, invisible to us and then the, the event grows by itself. And then suddenly, at fermentation, it, it is work and then bam, it explodes or, or it, it, it comes into place or in the country it disrupts what has been set up. Um, so for me, like this, this uh, this model of, of working and this interest uh, when we think about how it exists in time uh, is very much through fermentation. Yes, because I, I think it's, it's wonderful this notion of suspending our control. Actually, the agreement to suspend the control is it's the, the agreement to disagree in a way. Um, and maybe I can also give two examples of uh, performances or from the performing arts, in which the collectivity is different and in which you... Um, let me just give the examples. Uh, first example is um, this notion of collectivity in what has been called interactive theater in the 70s and 80s. And what I think there is that... Um, I don't think this is the kind of theater that Melissa was looking for when he was talking about experimenting ourselves alone without moving or something. Where you have the compulsory interactive theater where you 
have a new bank, say that you will liberate people from the old fashioned theater by experimenting themselves and body without organs. And I'm, I'm thinking, for example, about, and I don't want to be disrespectful, I'm just saying that this is one kind of interactive theater that is not agreeing to suspend all control. And so I'm, I don't want to be disrespectful, I'm very careful about that. But thinking about the Argentinian theater by Hermann Nietzsche, for example which was like organizing also a big event uh, in which people could taste fruits and, and having uh, his, his chosen ones on a kind of carcass, which was then with blood dripping to experience uh, the, the corporeal and all these kind of things. But everything was so orchestrated. And I was looking to a documentary on that manage, and all of it, he was like being the master of ceremony hiding in fact that he was in control because he was liberating all those people. And at one moment in the documentary, I felt that his master of ceremony was falling out of his role because something failed in his orchestrated big event, because someone was going off the limit, they started to throw food. So you see the camera registrating everything, and he was like there, becoming a bit nervous. So you see him falling out of his role of being the master of ceremony, and he's trying to ease these people. I don't know, we're crossing a bridge. This is going too far. But of course, he's the one in control. And there it was so obvious that the collectivity there was not an open co-creation. It was he being in control <clears throat> of everything along another dogmatic way of liberating people. Another example in which I feel much more resonating what you are dealing with this kind of co-creativity, co-emerging I, the agreement to disagree is a performance by, and it also touches upon the notion of activism and contemporary ways of activism, which I think is also very important. And it was, um, let's call it a performance, I don't know what to call it, but let's call it a performance by Benjamin Verdonk. And what he did was he built a tree house uh, in the middle of Barra Square, Brussels. Um, he's a performing artist, so, but what he did was, he built a tree house on market squares in Brussels, and that square is labeled by the, by the nature, by, by people who are living there, as dangerous. Because it's a deserted place, it's not interesting, it's boring, it's empty. So a lot of people, uh, city branders, so people involved in city branding, gentrification, they wanted to enliven the square by having a statue, by having the migrants away illegal people, and what he did was like, okay, I'm building a tree house there. I'm not isolating myself like in romantic times, away from the city, out in nature, the, the romantic nature, but I'm just building a tree house there. And I'm inviting people, passers-by, who, pass, who are living there, also people who are into a performance, because people know, of course, they are not know. He invites them for tea and coffee and a piece of cake. And he actually talks with these people all the time. And then you can ask yourself, okay, this is another kind of agreement to disagree because what they were talking about was not a script or a plot or a story by Shakespeare. He was asking questions to those people. Some of them were illegal, but some of them Some of them were, were uh, people writing a review for the newspaper about the performance. Some of them were like people who didn't knew he was a performing artist and wanted to see the performance. So we had a very interesting mix of a collectivity or a kind of open community. And what they were talking about was a kind of the, the, the questions that interested the people visiting the tree house. So there's also the notion of regulation because the narrative is open and the process is what evolves on the spot. And then you could ask yourself, does it have effect? It failed, because sometimes no one entered there, and he was sleeping there, his clothes were getting dirty, uh, it didn't have the kind of effect it had, but it did have an effect, because a kind of other discourse evolved. People started to think, people started to testify about, look, what I liked about this treehouse, and this was a migrant talking, a song by Kate, he really listened to me, and he didn't want to hear my story about what happened with me fleeing from my country because then you are accepted or not accepted when you can remember everything. 
He said, I cannot remember this because what is I remember I want to keep behind doors because it hurts when I talk about it. And then he said, like, but look, this, this is something I felt listened to, not because I had to tell my story to be accepted or not, but I could be there and these thoughts were percolating into all these bodies visiting the treehouse, percolating in a sense that was fabulating. And this is, I think, also kind of activism, a contemporary way of activism, that differs from what we believe activism can be in the sense of having those pamphlets like do this, eat this. It's, it's, it's more about a co-emerging eye on the spot in the event. Yeah. It to actually the, the general uh, topic of the conference, the back precursor, and I think it's, uh, it's quite a complicated concept, but also like a movement it, it uh, allows us to go in all these directions of time, and you call it the time of the event. I think that's kind of what the dark precursor uh, pertains most to, not as a as a mere logic of the beginning that falls in a certain kind of causality, or in thinking the the Yes, besides the real time of the moment, as that where, where the form of act happens, but extending what act as a form of activity or activation might mean, and then also rethinking the question of time and of activism. And, and I think uh, I'm curious to now that we have uh, launched this conversation and really thinking activism not something that is uh, uh, attached to a kind of uh, general logic of politics. Uh, in, in the major sense, but really in, in more micropolitics, in micropolitics and politics that happen in, in all kinds of uh, constellations where things are being over and over negotiated, where different kinds of uh, forces uh, tie into each other. And thinking uh, this question of uh, the, um, in, like, is the, the, the form of activism that we might be interested in or talking about uh, and Aaron Gates with the neurodiversity movement, a uh, quite a poignant uh, example. Uh, isn't it about the multiplication of forms of time and timing in general that might be interesting to think about nowadays? Uh, which also allows uh, art uh, and philosophy and uh, all kinds of other modes of practicing come together around these questions of how to deal with these temporalities and have to interlace them, weave them, make them resonant. I don't know if that's far off. Maybe there's also a question, since I, uh, I'm assuming you all are very deeply involved in one practice or another, and there's several practices that stand between things often or that need to be negotiated. So it happens also on this kind of very individual level that is never really individual to so If I can connect what you were saying and what you were saying in a certain way. Uh, uh, you said you told this beautiful story where this refugee or migrant, you said we don't know something they are mixed, uh, that in a certain way he did not treat them as a refugee. And I think that can bring us exactly to the philosophical perspective also of time which you bring in, because if we treat them as a refugee, we treat them exactly from their past, where they left, and so, so we treat them in the way they have already gained their identity in a certain way. So we know, ah, you are from, so tell me your story. Yeah? So we are repeating simply <laughs> the stereotype of their story, and by asking them, tell me again, we are just repeating and repeating again this story. I think what is beautiful is that we take them in another time zone, if we suddenly treat them in asking them, for example, a serious question, yeah, uh, which is not directly uh, trapped already in that cliche of and I think, and that's also for in a broader sense, what I what is very important for my work also as a philosopher, primarily and as an artist also, that if we implement these non-controllable processes, we really have to see that they also can become destructive. 
And for me, that is a very important, and I don't want to criticize them because I made this distinction, but I would stay with it and stick with it and would defend it. And if you only lose control, that can become very destructive also. Yeah? So for me, the next question is always what gives them an artistic, I would say, twist in the way that suddenly this losing the control becomes in a certain way a process that starts to stimulate and become constructive. Because I would always criticize, uh, and maybe that is my Asian, my Asian self, which I have also in me, that in a certain way you should really be aware that sometimes, and I think that's also a difference, you should not forget that's also part of the verse, that he's not speaking only from the shock and the thing, but he's also speaking of beauty, even of Felicitas. <coughs> yeah? In this certain way, think of the Dickens story in uh, A Life of Immanence, where he loses self-control and self-control, but then, in the face of his death, he, he desires something, a beauty, which he could not experience before, as long, he was, as, long as he was a person, yeah, in a way of how he dealt with it. So for me it is important that even if I lose control, I can see sometimes that what you also said suddenly, something is growing and combining. I don't know why and, and how it works, but in a certain way there is something coming out, and in a certain way we have then the feeling that it's good. We don't know why, but we have a feeling that it works or functions or however you would like to call it. And I think these are, for me, very important things that we, we should add when we have this discourse on losing control and having a cut and all these things. Not every cut is true. You could tell the same story now in the circle. There is a performance in Austria going on from the political right. Yeah? So what is distinguishing that performance where they also would share many things now, now yeah? from, from other processes which are really creative. Mm -hmm. and so, so that would be important for me that we should not lose that thing that we have. In losing that can we still have a sense whether things work out well or do not work out well. Yeah? Um, maybe to bring it back to the field I'm working in. So that's the stage and with the students, my own stage at the, the work of the students. Um, if you completely connect to Arne, lose control, you will kill your partner. It's very simple or hurt him. On the other side, you have, as in the play with a ball, you have, if somebody is immediately throwing the ball to you, you have to, 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 uh, to get 